Okay, so uh, just to orient us, so Castlegard is here. Um, so it's right on the cusp, so it's the north boundary of Banff National Park, and, uh, and then it borders on Jasper National Park. And just, just north of this is, uh, so there's Mount Columbia and then Snow Dome. So that's the Great Divide. So the water flows north, east and west as of the Great Divide and Castlegard is right here. Um, so to get there, we're parking. So we call this the Big Bend. There's a huge switchback in the road. So we park there and then it's over a hill and then this is skiing up the Saskatchewan Glacier and then up um, then up a big moraine and across the meadows we call it and then you get to castle guard so it's a 21 kilometer ski to get to the cave and i didn't realize that would be as a clumsy of a so clumsy to flip between screens but so that so that's where castle guard is um, it was discovered in um, or it's been known about for a long time, but it, um, the exploration started in 1968. Um, and so the majority of it was, has been, was just sur um, surveyed in the 70s, and then a lot of scientific work went on in the 80s. 90s was not a lot happening. I'm just going to do a little flyby of the of the cave. So you go in the entrance here, and then the blue is the sump, and then here is just the major extent of the cave. Obviously following major fault systems, and then it goes here and it ends in these ice plugs as it's underneath the Columbia Glacier. Uh, so this is skiing up the Saskatchewan Glacier on a really nice day. Uh, really beautiful views when you're skiing across the meadows. Um, the beautiful views help you with the monotony of the skiing. And... <laughs> so that that was Tom. So, so Tom was one of the divers. It was minus twenty the day we skied up. It was a really nice day, nice and sunny, but um, uh, that was gross. <laughs> uh, sorry, you're seeing this all right now, right? Oh, am I? Are you hearing me okay? Maybe other people are mute. Okay. Yep, you're good. Everybody's yeah, just good. muted. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, okay, so the sump, um, so the sump was uh, found back in the early 70s, and it first was dived in the late 80s, and they only got, um, they got about 100, oh, sorry, 87, 125 meters penetration. And then it sat there as a really good lead, but they, they were open circuit divers. They didn't really have the means to take it any further. Um, and then, so then this guy, a British diver named Martin Groves heard about it in, um, in the late 2000s and came over and he was able to, in, his first diving trip laid 500 meters of line and he had to stop because he ran out of line. Um, so it was just, so it was like very successful, but almost, I think within the, on the first dive, he was finished well, all he could do that time. So then uh, he came back. So two years later, he comes back and finish it, gets all the way through and gets to the other side of the sump uh, total sump is 845 meters, but he uh, doesn't want to get out of the water. Like he doesn't want to de-kit, take off his dry suit or anything, because one, he hasn't allocated enough time 
to get out and do that and two it's super risky if anything happens on that other side to for him to be alone and not be able to fix whatever could go wrong um, so then he comes back in 2012 with the dive partner and the ice crawls which are right at the beginning of the cave um, so we sleep at the entrance and then it's like 20 30 meters you there's a eight meter pitch you go down and then right away you hit these ice crawls so it's um just like remnant water that gets frozen during the winter and if conditions are ideal you can lay on your back and just crawl on the on the roof and and get through but um so in 2012 they had built up so much they just couldn't get through and so the whole trip was canceled um on that i think on that trip um greg horn which is one of, of our um cavers and park staff he had brought in a chainsaw and he so he tried to chisel out some of the passage but the, it was blocked shut so then he just was choking himself out with the exhaust from the chainsaw um so 2013 they come again um small people could get through but martin the diver wasn't really that small and he was ends up like just like wallowing in slush and getting hypothermic and just called it quits and went skiing so after that um he you know it was a good lead but he kind of ran out of um ran out of uh, spirit for it So, but based on his dive, this was his prediction of what the cave does, which is a hell of a good lead, right? <laughs> um, and so then, so it sat there until Tom Crisp came over. Oh, and sorry, to deal with the, uh, with the ice crawl problem. So the ice crawls had um in when the cave was being surveyed and researched in the 70s and 80s the ice crawls were never a problem in the 90s once in a while it would freeze um you get get so narrow that people couldn't get in and uh, sorry i should say that the trips are always in the winter at castlegard so in the so 90s there's a couple accounts of it happening and then so then in the last decade it's been really regular that it's there's so much build up you can't get into the ice crawls so um so we have so i've been skiing up there since 2012 i think every year probably two times a year just to make a physical observation of what's happening uh, and then we decided to get a bit smarter and we installed a camera so this is this is a uh caver equipment extraordinaire it is a so we've got a wildlife camera inside of um like irrigation pipe and then with a plexiglass covering and then mounted into the passage on this frame that has been made out of an old bed frame that we pulled out of a dumpster um but it's been there for like four years so or three or four years so far so it's doing pretty good um and and it's taking throughout the um it's taking four pictures a day i think and then on the other on the opposite side of the wall we nail nailed a, or screwed a ruler into the wall so it takes a picture every day and then we can watch the ice move and watch it move up the uh, up the ruler and when we did that, we also installed a camera on the outside of the cave. And so I think this next one is a video of that. So it's kind of fun to watch the snow go up and down. But what we learned from that one, so there was three flood events that year. So two of them went by really quickly. Um, 
and and then snow came in September and never left again, which you can also see there. Um, so this year, so Tom Crisp heard about the dive at Castlegard and convinced Harry, who's on the phone here today, and Craig, um, so both cave divers from Australia, to come over and get in on this amazing lead that has been sitting there for years. So they're coming over. Um, I I, I kind of knew that they didn't really know what they were getting into, but they had some winter clothes on and we rented them some skis and sleeping bags and uh, tried to make it all happen. So we sent, there was a team of six people went in a day early and um, before like the mass of us came up with all of the diving gear. So they came in a day early and at midnight after they left, um, we, I got a uh, in reach message that says the ice crawls are too small and bring lots of batteries. So um, I had skied up there three weeks before and thought it was okay. So in the meantime, the ice crawls had gotten narrower. But um, in the, between 2012, which was the last time we tried to use a chainsaw, and this year, the difference was that we ha now had electric chainsaws. So now we've got an electric chainsaw in this goddamn ice crawl. So, and if you could see, um, he was wearing goggles in there. It's super windy. Um, so to work it that, yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it, it was, it was quite ridiculous. He was usually wearing like a Davy Crockett hat and ski goggles and chainsawing this ice in a cave. So it, it was, did seem quite absurd. Um, but, uh, and then, so then this is when we finally started hauling gear. So it took, I think it took us two days just to get in the first 200 meters of the cave. Uh, but after that, then it was game on. And uh, so here's where we finally get all the gear to the sump. And I think the divers are finally having a look at what looks like a really awesome dive, which is that lovely blue water down below. Uh, Harry, do you want to take it? Do you want to do the descripting of the dive? Uh, well, of course, I didn't end up diving myself. Yeah, I know. I've probably know as much as you do from the video. But, uh, <laughs> at least I'll be able to describe the gear and stuff, I guess. Uh, the videos on this Zoom don't seem to run very well. They're quite glitchy. Are they um, dropping? Okay. Yeah, but give it a go. Uh, so Tom and, and Craig uh, did the two dives. Um, basically, at, at one of the rig ramps uh, destroyed on the trip in, so we had to be here for. And I was also a bit destroyed by the environment, so uh, I was happy to step back and let those boys do the, do the dive. So the tunnel is quite spacious. There's plenty of room. Uh, two dives. Uh, I went in single file. Craig went first. You can see. Uh, line there and there were only two spots that they had to re repair the line uh, on the way in. I'm suggesting that the flow through there is not, you know, massive during the season. Uh, just having to do the repair. just on an hour to get through the 800 meters. So they're both wearing these chest mount rebreathers, these small 
um, rebreathers made in France. They're called a Triton rebreather. So it would be a good tool because, uh, because they fit in the cave pack pretty well. One of the things we hadn't really thought through was how to package up the properly because we weren't really aware of how you know gruesome the the uh, the tunnel through to the sump was um, you know it's basically all crawling or or wriggling on your belly and pushing packs in front of you so it was very very hard on the dive gear so that's the first big lesson we learned is you know the, the gear needs to be really well wrapped and and padded and, and bundled up um, so at the end of the video Katie that, that's the end of that clip yeah, yeah. A um, couple of side passages were seen on the way through, which I'm sure Katie will, will mention because it might be one of the sources of the water oh, uh, for the summer sorry. flooding. Uh, these big, um, now we call them gore pools or mill pools, but um, Chris Smart calls them pots, I think. So anyway, they look like some kind of erosive hole caused by the flow and swirling rocks to me in the floor of the, the cave, which were pretty impressive. Yeah, oh, very okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so then so this is the what they see on the other side. Um, so decently spacious but not massive. And so they got out of the water and they will ab were able to see they, they surveyed 65 meters of passage. So 30 meters of it continues kind of in this, like in a smaller sort of phreatic shape. And then it goes into really Vados. Um, so it, the, the cave was going quite well, but they were caving in their diving dry suits. So when the cave started to get more rifty and sharp, that's where they called it. So uh, there's still, by all means, like good going passage. They just weren't dressed to 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 go there this time around. Um, so sixty five meters of passage continuing. Um, yeah, looks looks pretty good. And then a couple other things underwater, as Harry mentioned, um, that are possibly where the water's coming from. Um, and this is so this is upstream going into the mountain. Um, so they kind of did all they could do. Um, so they ended up, so that's two dives that they were able to um, go through here and try and survey. They tried to redo the underwater survey tool, or sorry, they tried to remap the underwater stuff that had been done before and they had a nifty new device, but it did not function so well with dry gloves. So then that's another learning. Um, one of the others, so uh, there was a few mapping objectives we wanted to do here, but so from the previous dive data, when we put it with the old data, we had this really ugly junction with the map. So we had never, weren't able to clean that. W one of the things we wanted to be able to do was clean that up and feel more confident with, with, who, with whose data was good. Um, so we were able to do that this time around. Um, and so this is the the cave map. Uh, so there's the total underground dive is 845 meters. So we've chopped up like the all the underwater stuff isn't displayed here, but there's the um, just leading up into the sump and then the other end of the sump, which is still looks looks really good um, and is very consistent with the rest of the cave. So. Um, yeah, still, still feeling positive about that. Um, and then, so there was six of us that stayed the whole time with the divers, but once they were kind of set up to go diving, we went into the dry cave. Um, so there's a couple of shots. Um, going, going back into this cave really gave me a lot more appreciation. So I've been going every year for the last eight years uh, but I always go just to the entrance and check the ice. So finally getting deeper into the cave. Um, I like it a lot more now. And 
you can really see the complexity um, and the, like the multiple ages and the, the long history of this cave, which is really cool. So these are um, so it's some of the decorations in here um, that you just you don't really expect when we say like we have this cave that runs underneath a glacier. Uh, this photo got chopped, but the one on the left, you can so the, there's a, a flag that's growing one way and then a style beside it with the flag growing the opposite direction. And then all these halotites that are they're kind of they're growing with the wind. So we think either this is seasonal airflow so in the winter this drip is going and in the summer that drip is going or if these are just um, thousands of years apart when those grew um, and then the other one the one on the right is like so it had this big flag and then then the the wind died down and it had a big flag and then the wind died down so um, and then this is the, the one on the left this is a style that grew and then got eroded away and then on the right, this is a, a massive, um, like five meter tall flowstone deposit that's been dated back to 1.2 million years. Um, and then it was re-dissolved 50,000 years ago, which kind of um, the second two ice ages ago type of thing. Um, and Castlegard is really well known for its cubic cave pearls. So there's five, known five caves in the world known to have cubic cave pearls and this is one of them and they are yeah they just they look like um a box of roger's sugar which is very very curious um so in the 80s one of the things done was to take um i think they took three um sugar cubes with them and so this is uh, the right side is electron microscope cutting through it so it starts as a normal cave pearl um, and and then uh, they think so then it was it got all packed in side by side and they grew as cubes because they were sitting beside other things and couldn't move is the uh, kind of the theory um, and then the other thing Castlegard is known for is just being really long it, as a, it's a caver's cave there's very little SRT you were just like really actively caving the whole time so this is the subway uh, and then you're in the fissures. Um, so the first fissure is like um, half a kilometer long, and then the second fissure is one one and a half kilometers long. So you're just like stemming all the time. Um, some of them are pretty big drops, and and I love this is Catherine's face <laughs> hugging the wall. Don't die. Um, <laughs> there's no oh, uh, that's mini holes in the floor um so we got to so this is the ice plug behind us um so no one had been there since i think since two, uh, 2012 um and we're just fooling around here but it's it's pretty cool like glacier ice underneath um and then Jeremy and I went off to a second ice plug. So this one's called the Zare Glass. And it is interesting. So the other ice was, de de it's not solid, but it, it's kind of like, like you could scrape it and make a nice snow cone. And then this ice is like really sublimated. So it was, there's something cool. It's very lattice structured. Um, and I don't totally understand what's going on behind there. But the reason we were there was to collect organics. And so we were told there was organics found in the late 80s. Um, and you're like, okay, so we're going to go to the spot. And I, I don't know exactly what to look for. I hope I can figure it out. But we get there and it's like, it looks like a den. Like it totally looks like you were walking beside a cliff and looked underneath and something like lives in there. Um, so there's so there's little bones and it like absolutely looks smells like dirt, um, except for this is this is 239 meters below the top of the Columbia ice field. Like this is way far below. So uh, running theory. So there was a, um, a a big forest up where there is now a glacier between. Um, between 
the end of the second ice age. So this should be, this is something like 10,000 years old. Uh, oh, this was just my little diagram to show um, where we were and how far we are. Okay, uh, so another uh, objective that we had was to fix the survey loop error. So uh, this Munchkin peon um, connects in with the main passage. So it's a one kilometer loop and we had a 90 meter error and it was, it was just so bad and threw things off that in the published survey, it, we just left it disconnected because you're like, I like don't know what to do with it. Um, so our, our objective was to fix that error. We knew something had been resurveyed, but we didn't know what it was. Um, but we knew that that survey hadn't fixed it. So we were kind of like, well, then let's probably what we should do is survey the crappiest section because that's probably what needs to get resurveyed. Um, so that's what we did. So 300 meter survey of Munchkin Peon. Uh, this doesn't look, this makes it look pretty good. Um, just a lot of kind of low passage and some muddy stuff, some crawling through water. Um, but, and then, and then we came out with that, we got into the rabbit hole of the data. And when you get into it, you see things like uh, way too consistent shots, my, all these minus fours, you're like, what's going on there? And then you go back to some original notes and then what's in our walls data is not what was in the notes. So we thought, so um, in the, before walls, the data had been, someone had manually changed for the, corrected for the ma magnetic declination, but we think they applied the same number to a couple decades of data. So it was like, oh boy. So we spent a lot of work trying to back calculate and get the numbers better, but now, um, so this is that little tip here, should be connected to here, but we now have a 10 meter loop error in a one kilometer loop. So we're very happy. Um, so this is the team, this is our haul out team. Um, there was 17 people in total that helped with this. Um, so a majority of people came in at the beginning or the end and helped with hauling dive kits. Um, and then the divers, uh, so this is Craig here. I'm hoping you can see my cursor. Um, where is, and then Harry and Tom are the divers. Um, and then the rest of us, mostly ASS. Um, I had to go a bit out. So there was a few people that weren't actually cavers, um, but were better skiers and had strong backs. So. We got a few people into their first cave, uh, which is pretty funny. And I meant to, to throw in some more pictures of camping at the entrance, but at the entrance of this, um, at the mouth of this cave, so there was about 15 of us camped in there, a um, couple stoves. We you go 200 or 100 meters down is a spring that I actually think is, um, might be connected to the sump that we were diving. And so that's where we're getting our water from, but the, and so it's pretty regularly minus, minus 20, wake up in the morning, it's minus 25 degrees. So it's um, a few things to get accustomed to. Um, oh, these guys, so these guys came at the end and they had so little weight in their, in their, in their uh, backpacks, they had brought in real chili instead of freeze dried. Um, and then we're all sitting there after having been up there for 10 days eating oatmeal and these guys want some sympathy and they're not getting anything from us because their chili had frozen. Yeah, you can break those pieces up to make them look like this. That's true. Well, stop now. Oh, shit. Oh, yes, that was. <laughs> Keep doing that, sorry. Ah, so, it's slightly absurd. Um, this is a diagram um, done up in, in the 80s to help try and explain what's going on with the 
with the cave. Um, so we go in at the entrance and then we are gradually, gradually climbing up. Um, and, and then you start hitting the ice, the ice plugs. And, but the, this is a, a very fossil cave. And so what they, they sort of, the, this is the hypothetical course of Castle Guard 2. So this is where we think the most of the water goes today. And that there's actually, there's a Castle Guard 3 that they kind of proved by dye tracing um, that's coming in actually on the other side of the meadows. Um, so we're, so we're diving, diving the sump, but it actually seems that it's quite a stagnant stump, sump. Uh, it's not really, it's not part of the main flow, what we're thinking now. Uh, this is also based on, so this is temperature loggers that are coming off of those cameras. So there's a camera on the outside, a camera on the inside, and then this, there's a temperature logger with both of those. Um, so here we're marking out a couple of the flood events that happened um, during the summer. And you can see that those flood, flood events were very much correlated with um, high temperature days. Uh, and so it's a high temperature day and then a flood event, which would suggest that the water is coming quite locally. It's not coming from kilometers and kilometers away. Um, this is, this is, uh, this is old hy hydrological data. Um, and then there was a temperature logger in Boone Sump. And so this, is also showing so the temperature is actually pretty warm in the sump at 4.5 degrees celsius most of the time but then it drops in um, june july and uh, so that would also suggest so that it's getting a big insurgence of localized of like melt water and then um, in the summer months um, and then it, and then it goes up. So that could be um, that. So this could be really local water coming in and cooling down the sump. And then this warmer water could be the water. So the increased volume of water pushes warmed up water from l further back in the system up here. And then all of a sudden you get an increase in temperature. Um, and so this is, so this is the, um, going into the the sump. Okay, so this is this dropping into the sump, and this is the sump gradually, gradually coming up, and then the dry chunk of survey that's on the other side, and then we're looking at it side by side with. So this is the entrance of the cave, the first pitch that we go down. We crawl through the ice crawls, uh, and then you keep going, and then you would drop down this. Uh, this is a 21 meter pitch here. Um, so, let me see, so, uh, kind of thinking that the, the, the sump water drains just kind of out a different way, but this is through really narrow, this isn't diveable passage, it's just like tiny slots. And other interesting thing is, so if, so red line representing potential, like, um, the summer flood line. So we need, we need enough water that it's gonna, the water's gonna rise up the eight meter sump and come out the entrance. And, um, and so here, if it rose up to that, so if it's at the red line, it can start flowing out the cave. But if it goes much higher than that, the water could actually start flowing back into the sump here, which could be part of that um, cold water influx that we saw in June and July. Um, but yeah, we're just, the, the old theory was that the water in the sump, there was so much water in the sump, it rose out of the sump and flows out of the cave. And based on what we're looking at now, that's not really what we think is happening. Um, but this is the view when you come out of the cave um, and that kind of helps make up for the cold temperatures. Uh, so yeah, it's a pretty beautiful, iconic place. The uh, Castle Guard experience is definitely um, one of its own. 
and yeah, it's those. Are, I just threw in some backup slides there, but that was that was what I had. Um, Harry, I kind of I kind of cruised by the sump because I thought Tom would be here um, to say a little bit more. Um, so I don't. I it, it, um, Harry was breaking up a bit um, on my end. So I don't know for other people, but he said so. One of the rebreathers on their haul in got damaged so he never ended up diving he lent his to tom um and some of their other gear got wet and stuff so um the the stuff need the the crawl to get to the sub so it's 1.5 kilometers and a lot of it is just um awkward the low crawl ways over rocks and crappy and things getting grabbed and um so we'll have to pack pack our gear a bit better for next time but we do plan on a next time